Hello, everyone. Today we're talking about the eight ways to detox from soul ties and their destruction. Okay. And before we talk about detoxing from soul ties, we need to know what a soul tie is. Okay. And so, uh, when you think about a soul tie, what it really is, is just simply a connection, a connection between two individuals. Okay. And this connection could be emotional. It can be mental, physical, <laughs> spiritual, financial. Okay. And when we're talking about the soul, we're talking about the mind, the will, and the emotions. Okay. So when you're talking about a soul tie, let's picture you got some brand new gym shoes and you pick up one gym shoe and you take one shoelace, right? And you lace up that particular gym shoe, right? And then at the end, you've got the two strings. So think about those two strings being the two di different individuals, right? And you take those two strings and you cross them and then you make a knot and then you cross it again and then you make a knot prior to you making the two bunny rabbit ears, right? So those two knots are equivalent to what happens when two individuals cross over and create what you call a soul tie, okay? And so soul ties, they're real easy to create, but guess what? They are very difficult to get rid of, okay? Very difficult. And think about it when you have a shoe, right? When you have your shoe, and you've gotten a knot in the shoe and you keep pulling and pulling. You've already got the two knots there, right? And you keep pulling and pulling because you got the two knots and the bunny rabbit ears. The next thing you know, you've got a third knot and a fourth knot. And before you know it, your emotions literally <laughs> are all tied up and in a knot over this particular shoe, right? And so that's how it is when it comes to soul ties. You try to pull and pull and pull yourself out of it. But what happens is you become more and more entangled. You see what I'm saying? Because you underestimated just how dangerous it was going into that particular relationship, right? And you underestimate um, just how easy it is to come out of a soul tie. That's the other thing, right? So, okay, so we got soul ties, right? And then with soul ties, we got both unhealthy as well as healthy soul ties. Because you think about, oh, soul ties, that's got to be terrible. No, we can have a combination of both. You got David and Jonathan, right? They were best friends and they were more like brothers. They had what you call a healthy soul tie, right? In 1 Samuel 18, it says, And it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. And Saul took him that day and would let him go no more to his father's house. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was upon him and he gave it to David and his garments, even his sword and to his bow and to his girdle, okay? And although they had a healthy soul tie, Saul was still Jonathan's father. We cannot escape that fact, right? And Saul was filled with what? There was a spirit of insecurity, right? We had rebellion. He had toxic jealousy that led up to malice, right? And so although uh, Saul's re rebellious behavior it came out earlier, but when it came, and this has happened when it came to following the Lord's instructions with the Amalekites, right? God told him to get rid of everybody. He did not kill Agag, right? And then he kept some of the cattle and he thought that that was okay. It was not okay according to the Lord, right? And so David's insecurity came out when the lady started singing about how Saul had conquered... <laughs> thousands and David, his 10 thousands. It was true, right? What they were singing about was true, but that's when we see what was in Saul, uh, inside Saul's heart began to come out. All of that insecurity came out. Okay. 
And so even though a soul tie can start off healthy, okay, it can end up being very damaging in the end. So you could start off with a healthy soul tie, but then you got the fact that people change. We cannot control <laughs> whether or not a person is going to change. The only thing we can do is control uh, our responses to their changes, right? We can only control our own behavior, right? We got self-control. And then we also have this illusion of control. And in essence, God is in control, but we got self-control, right? Hopefully. <laughs> so that's why it's important to follow our intuition when it comes to having relationships with people and the Holy Spirit speaking to us and letting us know whether this individual is a safe person to bring into our lives and have us walking along that, you know, beside us in our journeys, okay? Because what may be good for us in one season, in the next season, it may not be good for us. But if we're walking around thinking that somehow or another people do not change and we have blinders on, we're going to long for something different. And that longing for something different means that we are setting up expectations for a person to be something different than who they are, than what your intuition is showing you, than what the spirit of discernment is showing you about this person, okay? When we long for something different, then we're going to get something different. But we're going to get everything else that goes along with that, right? So later on, we have Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth, okay? Mephibosheth ended up with an orphan spirit, okay? And this was after losing his father, Jonathan, and after losing his grandfather, Saul. Saul and Jonathan were both killed in the same war, okay? And so uh, the spirit, that orphan spirit, it has a deep sense of insecurity that's at the root of it, okay? And so more than likely, Saul's deep sense of insecurity, that brokenness, got passed down to his grandson when he became an orphan. It settled in, right? And then because of David's connection with Saul, David ended up not only with a trauma bond, but also with a soul tie. And this was a trauma bond, trauma bonded and soul tie to Saul. And you may think, well, trauma bond, well, what is that? Okay. He experienced trauma from the relationship that he had with date with uh, Saul. So David looked at Saul as this is the father figure, right? This is my father figure. And then you got this father figure who is now, who seemed like he loved me at first, but now cannot stop coming after me until he kills me, right? That's got this murderous spirit on him. So that causes trauma. So when you think of a trauma bond, you think of two people together and take some gorilla, gorilla glue and glue them and bind them together, okay? So it's like that person knows that this is dangerous for them, but they keep going back because they're trauma bonded to that person. So that's how it was between David and Saul. And then as far as, um, as, far as that orphan spirit from David's grandson, you got that that was brought down, right, from the spirit of insecurity. And then with David and Saul, you got that murderous spirit that was going down, right, that was in uh, Saul's soul. You cannot separate. That's the thing about it. When it comes to a soul tie, the soul is your mind, your will, and emotions. You cannot separate and say, okay, I'm just going to take the mind. I'm not going to take the will and emotions. So I'm just going to take the will, but I don't want that person's emotion in their mind. When you connect with a person, you have a connection, you get the whole package deal, right? And so uh, we had the trauma bond we discussed, right? But then we got David that's got an emotional tie with Saul. That emotional tie was from Saul being his father figure, okay? Then he's got an emotional tie with Saul because he was Saul's, I guess I would say, emotional pacifier, slash personal musician, right? He was the emotional pacifier slash personal musician for Paul. Every time, not Paul, I meant to say <laughs> Saul. Every time this evil spirit came upon Saul, David's uh, playing. And then the next thing you know, he's ducking and dodging as spears are being thrown at him, right? This man that's supposed to be his father is like literally trying to kill him, okay? So he's got the trauma bond, 
Then he's got a soul tie because he's got that emotional connection from uh, Saul being like his father. He got the emotional connection from being Saul's passive, emotional pacifier. He got the emotional connection from being his personal musician. Then he's got an emotional connection because he's also financially tied to Saul because Saul is providing his paycheck. And whenever you got money involved, <laughs> emotions are tied into it, okay? And your emotions can go up and down, literally, like a roller coaster, especially if you're expecting to get paid and you're not going to get paid and then see how <laughs> see how your mind, the thoughts get to going and those emotions that's attached to those thoughts, see how you start to go up and down, right? And start to possibly lose control because of this, right? Everything that we think has emotions tied into it, okay? And so although we might be healthy, we still got bits and pieces of us that are unhealthy from our parents, right? And these bits and pieces, they get passed down from generation to generation to generation. So think about this. David has a soul tie with Jonathan. David has a soul tie with Saul, right? So what about David's kids? You got a son, Absalom, that's got a rebellious spirit. Who else had that rebellious spirit in him? Saul, right? Okay. He didn't do what the Lord told him to do. He had a rebellious spirit and ended up with a murderous spirit. So you got Absalom with the rebellious spirit. Absalom with a murderous spirit, right? Then you got David, <laughs> who also gets some little drops of that, the blood that was leaking out, right? Because our issues leak out all over everywhere. They bleed out. So you get David, <laughs> who got some of the, that blood sprinkled on him. He ends up with some of that murderous spirit. And just like Saul uh, tried to use other people, and those other people were the Philistines, to end up uh, destroying David, killing him. What do David do? He uses the army to try to kill Uriah and Uriah does indeed get killed. Then what does his son Absalom do with this murderous spirit? He uses his servants, pretends like he's God and says, have I not commanded you? He uses pretty much the same words that God used with Joshua. Have I not commanded you this day? Be of good courage. Okay, so he didn't take in the place of God to call himself uh, rectifying the situation because of his sister being uh, violated by the half-brother, okay? So Absalom <laughs> has this murderous, rebellious spirit in him, right? And he ends up having his half-brother killed through his servants. I mean, it's, it's just a hot mess. But all of this is because David was tied into Jonathan, who was Saul's father, right? So we got all of these soul ties going on, okay? Emotional and financial soul ties going on, right? And so that's why they say, be careful of who you hang out with. Be careful. They say the five people, the average of those five people that we're hanging out with the most, that's who we are going to be behaving like, right? And then we can think that, okay, like I said, we just take one thing. We take their will. We don't want their emotions in their mind, or we take their mindset, but we don't want the will or the emotions. You get the whole package deal. It's kind of like when you call the cable company, you want to set it up. And then you say, well, I know I'm only going to watch these 10 channels. Or even if you have it already and you say, you know what? I got access to over 300 channels. I'm not watching all of them. I don't want to see all this. I just want my 10 plus like the news stations and the other basic little channels. And they say, mm -mm, you can't do that. Either you, if you're going to get the basic, you're not going to get those 10 with it. And the basic is almost like having nothing. <laughs> It's really no enjoyment of it. It's just basically just to have a clear picture on your TV. So they say either you get that or you get the package deal where you got everything included. That's how it is. <laughs> when you have a connection to somebody slash soul tie, you get the whole package deal. You get the good, the bad, and the ugly, right? <laughs> and that's why it's also important with the people that we're hanging around with the most, we can't control who they hang out with. But we also have to be careful of that because those people are hanging out possibly with other people who are toxic. And when you hang out with other people who are toxic, it's just plain and simple. OK, that toxicity drips out on you, just like it did with David. And he had the idea of uh, sending you Raya right up there to the front lines to be killed. Right. But it started off with Saul. So that's why we got to be careful of who we are connecting our souls to. You see what I'm saying? Because it's the mind, the will, and emotions, all of that, okay? So 
The next situation we want to look at is this soap opera that's entitled Manipulation, Deceptions, Soul Ties, and Babies. Once again, Manipulation, Deception, Soul Ties, and Babies is the name of the soap opera. You got two sisters. You got Leah and Rachel, okay? Jacob is madly in love with Rachel. And the Bible talks about how beautiful Rachel is and how Leah had a weak eye, okay? And I know that the scripture tells us things it doesn't tell us just to be telling us. It tells us because that's an important factor in seeing, getting a whole picture of what was really going on, okay? So Jacob agrees to work for Rachel seven years. He worked the seven years. He's like, hey, give me my wife. I'm ready to be with my wife. And his uncle Laban tricked him and instead gave him Leah, Rachel's older sister. Jacob didn't find out until the following morning, right? So Leah and Jacob worked together, okay? They're in cahoots to deceive and manipulate Jacob into thinking that he's gotten Rachel, right? Okay, so Laban ends up telling Jacob, you got to work another seven years for Rachel. After one week, I'll go ahead and give her to you, but you got to work another seven years for her. So talk about a hot mess. You work in 14 years, 14 long years, for one woman, but he was in love with Rachel. His soul was tied to Rachel, right? But here's the problem. This is where the problem comes in into this messy situation that they had going on. But as the scripture says, nothing new under the sun. We have the same mess going on. We find ourselves in the same messy type of situations, right? The Bible makes it clear that Leah was hated by Jacob, right? Makes it very clear. And it makes it very clear that Rachel was loved and she was barren, okay? And I'm going to read from scripture just so we can see, just to get an idea of the mess that was going on, right? When the Lord saw Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren and Leah conceived and bare a son. And she called him his name Reuben, for she said, because the Lord has looked upon my affliction for now, my husband will love me. She conceived again and bore a son and said, because the Lord has heard that I'm hated. He has given me this son also. And she called his name Simeon. Again, she conceived and bare a son and said, now this time, <laughs> my husband will be attached to me because I born him three sons. Therefore, his name was called Levi. And she conceived again. Okay, so we on baby number four. And bore a son and said, this time I will praise the Lord. Therefore, she called his name Judah. Then she ceased bearing. Okay, so that was the scripture verses. Okay, now this is the point where we need to start singing that old Jay song, old Jay song from back in the day. Your body's here with me, but your mind is on the other side of town. You messing me around. So Jacob was with, <laughs> Jacob was with Leah. His man was not with Leah. His man was with Rachel. <laughs> so instead of being on the other side of town, like that song, right? <laughs> she was in the tent right around the corner, so to speak, right? That's where his man was. Leah was so tied to Jacob, but Jacob was so tied to Rachel, right? And in this soul tie that Leah had for Jacob, she gets all of this hate brought on to enter her soul because she is with a man. And the scripture says, right, when you're joined together, right, you become one. So she's getting all of this hate, all of this blood that's dripping. All of this is dripping from Jacob onto Leah, this hate. But guess what? Leah was not innocent. She's not innocent in this situation. God blessed her when he saw she was hated, but she was not innocent. She went into cahoots with manipulation and deception, right? Both of those spirits were involved where she went in with her father Laban to trick Jacob and thought that something good was going to come out of it for a man that loved her sister and that did not love her. Like I said, the scripture makes it very clear. She was hated, okay? And so she ends up saying in those few verses I read, you probably heard where she says, now he's going to be attached to me. So like attached slash join, basically back the same thing. You know, when you think about attached, okay. And I also make me think about like a baby when you have the, the infants, the toddlers, and you kind of attach them on your hip and you walk around like that as you're doing stuff, you know, kind of to pacify them, so to speak. And she's saying, now he's going to be attached to me after she, you know, basically after like I've been made a baby factory, so to speak. But think about this. Her soul is tied into Jacob, right? Through two things, being a baby factory, right? 
and him having her body. Her soul is tied to him those two ways, but he never loved her. He only brought hate along. And Leah's lack of self-worth and being on that hamster wheel, running, right? Of hustling for a man who didn't love her is where her soul tie was at, right? Okay, so she had a double whammy. You got all those chemicals going on from being with her husband. And then you got all those chemicals in her brain as well because you're nursing babies, right? All of that. And you get chemicals come from soul ties, chemicals come from nursing babies. So she got like a double whammy of going on, okay? She created the situation herself, like I said, and God still blessed her, right? But thinking that just one more baby and he gonna love me, just one more baby, he gonna love me. She didn't kind of catch on to like, no, this is not a game. <laughs> He is not going to love you. At what point do you stop and look at what God says about you? But that didn't cross her mind. That didn't cross her mind, okay? The scripture says, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. And in this case, you got Laban and Leah put Leah and Jacob together. Not God, right? Their whole relationship was based off of deception. That was the foundation. It was not trust. And it's not, it wasn't with like God being underneath all of that. Okay. It was deception, manipulation, right? God still showed Leah grace and mercy, just like he does for us, but it didn't change the way Jacob felt about Leah. It did not. Leah's soul tied to Jacob, not only kept her running back, right? Because of all these chemicals, right? And absorbing all of this hate, but that soul tie kept her locked to him. Because remember, a soul tie involves your soul, and that is your mind, your will, and your emotions, right? And when your mind, think about it, when you got a soul tie with someone, and as you're healing, you get everything, you get like all these, all of a sudden, you get these obtrusive thoughts coming in. You're like, where's this coming from? The person that you had the soul tie with, whether it was healthy or unhealthy, whatever was in their mind, it starts to flood through you. We, Like I said, we don't, we don't get well, we get to pick out whether we're going to pick the mind, pick the will, get, pick the emotions. We get the whole package deal, right? Like with internet and cable, right? So we get all of this stuff. So we got to deal with our own junk. And then we got to decide between the stuff that's going on in our mind. Is this my stuff or is this person, the other person's stuff that I'm trying to heal from, right? You got all of that. You got whatever emotions they had going on. And with her case, she had hate. So, I mean, you got all of this stuff going on. And so your question might be now, so how in the world do I get out of this? How do I detox from a soul tie and this destruction? Okay. Number one, you got to repent. You got to repent from sinning against your body, right? And in some places you might've gotten a soul tie. Your uh, ex may have been, uh, you might've been married to your ex. You see what I'm saying? So in that situation, sometimes going in, you didn't know. But a lot of times we have those little red flags and we're so caught up like with Leah, our self-worth is caught up and we're hustling for their approval, hustling for self-worth. You see what I'm saying? And we just ignore the signs, but you've got to repent for sinning against your body, right? And you got to ask God to create a clean heart and renew a right spirit within you to, to uh, pray and then ask him to completely remove every single sign every residue of that soul tie that happened with that in, uh, particular individual, right? That relationship with you were in. Because just because you think a soul tie, we think, okay, that has to be uh, ex-boyfriend, ex-husband, <laughs> ex-situationship, if you want to call it that. Because situationship is when you uh, have a person that you're in relationship with, but neither one of you guys have defined it. So it could even be a situationship that you were in. But you got to repent, Right. And then the thing about it too is along with repenting, you've got to, what? Creating me a clean heart, oh God. You got to pray that and renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, okay? And some of the older folk, they would say, well, you know, the best way to get over a man is to get under a new one. <laughs> that is not true, okay? That was a saying, but that could not be further from the truth, right? My belief is that the best way <laughs> to never get over a soul tie is to keep creating a new one with somebody else, okay? Third, you've got to, so number one was creating, a, uh, asking for repentance, for um, the Lord to forgive you and praying and repenting. Number two, 
okay? You got to end the act of sinning against your body. It's just plain and simple, okay? You got to end it. You've got to close shop, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> so you're repenting and you're not sinning against your body for number two. Number three, you got to go through withdrawal. And you're probably like, withdrawal? What are you talking about? Oh, yeah. You know how the person that's like, you know, and it's not a laughing matter. A person who goes to detox, right, for a drug and alcohol abuse because it's an addiction. A soul tie creates an addiction in your body. Your brain has gotten addicted to those chemicals, right? So you have got to go through the same cycle as a person that goes into detox. They're sweating and all of that. Not saying that you're going to be sweating, but your body is going to be involved. Okay? You have got to go through the addictive effects of a soul tie, right? The natural tendency, once the withdrawal symptoms set into your body, because it's going to come, the natural tendency is one to be like, whoa, oh no, this is terrible. So then next thing you know, you're numbing out to avoid feeling the symptoms. But guess what? Every time it's going to keep coming back and keep coming back and keep coming back and it's going to keep coming back in intensity. The intensity going to get stronger and stronger because as they said, you've got to feel in order to heal. Okay. It's no, there's no way around it. Okay. So what you have to do in that situation, you got to build up what they call containment, right? You got to build up resilience to be able to contain it. Like say, for instance, just give an example, two minutes. Okay. Allowing yourself to feel it. And you're doing that for maybe two weeks. Then the next time, three minutes and allow yourself and, and, you know, and coming out of, you've got to build up resilience, but there's no way you can do all of the work, all of the healing work. But if you refuse, if you numb your body out and refuse to deal with the withdrawal symptoms, you will not be able to heal properly. You're going to keep that soul tie and you will not be ready for when God has somebody else waiting for you. You see what I'm saying? When he said, this is the one, you're not going to be ready for it because you're going to bring that right into that. And there's so many women that don't go through the process and they end up having to end up uh, ending that relationship with the new person, right? Like the song, the old days, your body's here with me, but your man is on the other side of town. You're messing me around. That's what happens, okay? So number four, you have to release physical items they've given you. Flowers, teddy bears, letters, poems, shirts and t-shirts and sweaters and all type of clothing with cologne and where you're trying to keep his smell and all of that. You got to get rid of all of that, right? And sometimes it can be as extreme as getting rid of the furniture. You have got to start over. You got to start over fresh. And another thing some people may or may not agree with, foregoing prayers for that other person. And not that you don't wish them the best, not that you uh, don't later forgive them. When you are praying for a person, what does that make you do? There's going to start up some type of connection, right? After a while, you cannot be angry at a person that you're praying for, right? So you you just, you keeping that soul tag going. So if you want to heal, you got to release it and know, I prayed for that person. I prayed for him enough while I was in it with him. I need to give it to God and let it go, okay? So then the next thing is that, um, let's see, that was number four. Number five, you got to release obligations of collecting child support and alimony from this person. And check with your state about having it garnished from that person's check. Remember, we talked about the financial tie that David had to Saul, right? That financial tie is also an emotional tie. It's also keeping the soul tie going. You got to eliminate that, okay? Number six, uh, you got to develop containment for your soul damage in general. We talked about containment for the withdrawal symptoms, right? Going in and out and increasing the time, you know, maybe even keeping a notebook and recording. I was able to do it for this amount of time today. This is how my mind, body, and soul felt. This is, you know, what revelation the Lord gave me, that type of thing, writing it down. But for number six, you're developing containment for your soul damage. And what that is, is, you know, you already got the damage from the soul tie. So now you have to be careful of allowing anything else to come into your soul, Okay. And some things we can't control, as we talked about already. We cannot control everything. But what you got to do is minimize podcasts that might be talking about certain things that you know that could possibly like just give you all of this pain, right? Then you got to minimize TV shows. You got to minimize listening to certain music. You might even minimize certain situations that's going to come up, even with something as simple as like you would think, okay, well, it's not simple as something you're thinking, okay, maybe I'll 
uh, watch this thing on racism on TV. Your soul has been damaged and it might literally set your soul on fire. Literally, you feel physical pain because your soul is like, ah, screaming. I can't take anymore. So you have to remember that you got to minimize and contain your soul damage. And just like you had to work your way up to being able to feel those withdrawal symptoms, you got to wake work your way up, your resilience of your soul being able to tolerate pain again. And it's a little bit at a time, right? But working every day on it. And even certain relationships, people that you know that's like petty and negative and toxic, you even got to minimize that. You got to minimize stress. You got to minimize soul pain. It's just no way around it, okay? Number seven, you got to do things his way. His way is stands for healing, identity, self-worth, width, affirmations, and yielding, okay? Those six things, right? His way, okay? If you don't do things his way, and in that order, you write back again, right? And then you'd be like, oh, I feel like I uh, got involved in the same type of relationship. You did. The last, you'll notice like the last six or seven men, the same man, but a different name, right? You've got to heal. You got to take time for it. It's just no way around it. Number eight, the final one is to create new software. And that new software is just creating a new mindset, okay? So number one for creating new software is to realize, hey, I've got a choice. Either I can move forward or I can remain right where I'm at. Then number two, ask yourself, what is the truth about the situation I just came out of? Or if you're still in it, what is the truth about what I'm in, right? Number three, you got to feel and you got to grieve the feelings that this truth brings you. Because remember, we talked about the fact that emotions are attached to thoughts, right? And memories. We can't get away from those emotions. Every thought, every word that you have has an emotion attached to it. So when you come to the truth, right? When you have that come to Jesus moment and say the truth that'll set you free, as the scripture says, there are going to be emotions that come. And it might not be right away, but when it comes, it's going to come. You got to be able to feel it instead of suppressing. Remember, we're moving forward. Suppressing means you're remaining. Number four, take responsibility for your part in the truth. What part did you play? What role? Because we all played a role. Whether it was ignoring your intuition when God said, get out. Ignoring your intuition when you had the red flags, you were love bombed and you started to stay in. Ignoring your intuition when you saw, when you got that look, as we talked about when I talked about toxic jealousy with Saul and David, you got that look. That's usually first. When somebody look at you differently, ignore your intuition this person has changed. Their whole countenance has changed against me, right? Even when Jacob and Laban, even though both of them were tricksters, Jacob got to the point where he realized Laban's countenance against him had changed. He knew it was time to leave from there and go back to his homeland, okay? So the next one is number five, acknowledge you cannot change what happened. I don't care how many times we go through the story, how much we wish that we could rewrite it, how much we wish we can revise it. We can't change what happened. The truth is just the truth. What happened is what happened. History is history. We can't change it. Okay. We cannot change it. Okay. Number six, get rid of self-blame and unforgiveness. That's a whole process within itself. All right. Number seven is you reframe the situation. How do you reframe the situation? I like to think of reframing as this, okay? This is my definition of reframing. You take an old situation, you put a new frame on it, right? With a new perspective, okay? That's how you know you want to, re, uh, to move forward. When you reframe, right? I'm going to say it again. You take an old situation, you put a new frame on it, right? And you got a new perspective, but if you take that old situation and you put an old frame on it with a new perspective, that means you want to remain. When you put a new frame, that means you want to move forward, okay? Because when you take an old frame and you put, uh, you take an old situation, you put an old frame on it, right? And you use a new perspective, that means you want to, well, I would have done this and I could have done that and I should have come done this if only since then. And you just keep going on and on and you standing on the port and you're waiting for that ship to come back. That ship has sailed. I always say that the would have, could have, should have, if only that ship has sailed. So that means you want to remain. If you want to move forward, you're going to reframe. You're going to take that old situation. You're going to put a brand new frame on it, right? 
and you're going to put a new perspective on it, that I did the best I could. I made the best decision that I could make with the tools that I had at the time. Okay. That's how you move forward. Number eight, you get the cherry on top of the Sunday and that cherry is daily affirmations and quotes, right? Reminding yourself about what it is that God says about you. I am redeemed. I am the righteousness of God in Christ, right? I am the head and not the tail. I am above always and never beneath. I do not have to make up for anybody else's brokenness. I don't have to defend, right? We're saying all of this stuff to ourselves. I don't have to defend. I don't have to prove anything, right? And just over daily, I am enough in Christ. I am beloved. I am the daughter of a king. I am a child of God. And we're just going on and on and on till we get our own worshiping session in our household, right? And so just remember, you're already enough, right? You can reclaim your power and identity today, right? How do you do it? Grab your keys to the kingdom and get your inheritance. Thank you so much for listening. And if this has blessed you, please share it, like it, and have a blessed weekend. Till next time.